We all know China has been building up a massive military in the last few decades, and now nearly able to rival the US in the Pacific, and even outmatch them in the Western Pacific. But the bigger question that few have addressed when talking about Taiwan is do they have the capability to launch an amphibious landing, land enough troops, vehicles, tanks, equipment, supplies, and all the other essentials fast enough to support an invasion? D-Day, during World War II, involved over 150,000 troops, nearly 5,000 landing craft and ships, 300 escorts, and 300 more minesweepers. And all that was a shorter distance, and they didn't have to face hundreds or even thousands of guided missiles trying to sink them along the way. And they didn't have satellite imagery to alert them that they're coming. So could China do it today? But first, real quick, thanks to Conflict of Nations for sponsoring this video. And speaking of China's naval capabilities, you can even play as them and invade the US in Conflict of Nations. It's a free online strategy game that gathers millions of players worldwide. You can fight up to 128 other players in a real-time game that can take weeks to complete. It's also set in modern day, which I love, and with well over 100 units, things like tanks, fighter jets, submarines, and more. You can choose your strategy, forge alliances, engage in epic battles, and take over the world. And the game is also available on PC as well as mobile, and you can switch back and forth with your same account to keep building up your nation. And my viewers get an exclusive gift. Click on my link down in the description and you'll get 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription time for free. This offer is only available for the next 30 days though, so act quickly. First, a bit about China's military. Now you may have heard of Russian BTGs, or battalion tactical groups, that are being used in Ukraine. That is, or at least was, their basic operational unit. It's smaller, at the battalion size, which means roughly around 800 people each. The US uses BCTs, or Brigade Combat Teams. It's a brigade, so it's a lot larger, consisting of several battalions and about 4,000 people total. China also uses brigades, often referred to as Combined Arms Brigades. They are though significantly larger than the US ones. Instead of typically consisting of around three maneuver battalions, the Chinese ones will have four, five, or sometimes even six battalions. They also have their own air defense battalion in each, something that the US does not have. These brigades can have 5,000, potentially up to 7,000 people in each. Bigger isn't necessarily always better though. It really depends on the situation. If you're fighting a small enemy force on a remote island, then you don't need a full brigade, for example. It would just eat up way too much supplies and support just trying to base them there. But during a large scale World War II style conflict, for example, individual brigade units just aren't enough and they could complicate command and control, planning, logistics, combined arms operations, and so on. So you need larger. And that's actually why the US Army's 2030 plan is to be much more modular so that it can be adapted to each situation. But China's combined arms brigades come in three main variants, light, medium, and heavy. The heavy revolving typically around modern battle tanks, medium with infantry fighting vehicles, and light with infantry with light vehicles or armored personnel carriers. These light combined arms brigades and variations for amphibious assault would be essential for the initial stages of an invasion of Taiwan. Their vehicles and equipment are a fraction of the weight, making them much more easier to transport. One major factor in China being able to succeed in Taiwan is its A2AD capability. Since China is virtually surrounded in the Pacific by potentially hostile nations, and given the US military's ability to project power right up to its coast with their aircraft carriers and overseas bases in Japan, South Korea, and so on, China desperately needed a way to stop them. Some sort of way to create a buffer to keep those forces out. The main part of this is China's ballistic missile arsenal. Things like the DF-21D, for example, threatening US aircraft carriers in the region, or other conventional ballistic missiles like the DF-15 and 16 that can strike US bases in Okinawa and South Korea, as well as the DF-26 that can reach all the way to Guam. They can create a massive zone keeping out any US or allied forces from challenging China, or at least put any unit that does enter that area in serious risk. So it would be a lot different than Ukraine. Once a war started, it would be extremely difficult for the US or any allies to supply weapons or support to Taiwan, being that it's on an island. Today in Ukraine, they can simply drive trucks right across the border in the west. Taiwan on the other hand would have to make do with what it has. The big issue in whether or not China would succeed is whether or not the US or anyone else would come to the defense of Taiwan. Now in the past, the US has not clearly stated whether they would defend them. However, President Biden has now stated multiple times that they would. What this specifically means though is up in the air. Is it just with weaponry, support, intelligence, etc.? Or sending fighter jets to help Taiwan maintain air superiority over the mainland? Or sending in troops? Or attacking Chinese ships involved? Or even striking Chinese bases in China? Also, how might other allies factor in? China could threaten Japan or South Korea and force them to limit any US aircraft and ships stationed there from operating. CSIS did a good write-up on this that you could check out here if you're interested. I'll leave the link down in the description too. So for now, we'll just look at China and Taiwan. 
First, the Taiwan Strait is extremely shallow, mostly around 50 meters or even less. Now that's way too shallow to really make good use of submarines. US subs are roughly 15 meters in height, and you'd want several meters beneath you to make sure you don't hit anything underwater. It'd be so shallow that you could almost see a submarine from above water in good weather conditions. Taiwan subs are slightly smaller in height, but not much. And this is really why they probably base a lot of them not on the west coast, but in the south where the water is deeper, and they could potentially be used to try to break any blockade of the island. So, submarines won't be of much use during an invasion from across the strait. Now, China obviously has a much larger military than Taiwan, but amphibious warfare is extremely, extremely tricky. There's a lot of factors to consider. The weather, obviously, like the sea conditions, currents, tides, surf, etc., but also your enemies' force availability and readiness, their routines, the potential for surprise, whether to launch at day or night, depending on your needs. Also, the time of the year would vary how much daylight there is. You also have to factor in contingencies. There's also many considerations when selecting a location to land. The most obvious and suitable sites will almost certainly be heavily defended and even mined. The locations need to be selected that are easily defensible from both the ground and by naval forces, as well as the air, offer some degree of shelter from weather and sea, ability to improve conditions as well as receiving and unloading supplies and reinforcements, air defense, and the ability to break out past the beachhead in advance. Terrain obviously matters. When it comes to a beach, a concave site might seem like the best, but it can leave you open to being attacked from all sides. A convex beach might be more preferable, but it offers less choices in terms of breakout. And then a straight beach line offers a mix of each's pros and cons. With all this in mind, there's no perfect spot to land, and Taiwan has built up numerous physical obstacles to limit any amphibious landing capability. A few different options, though, are just west of Tai'an City. There are several places here that offer decent positioning, and then also to take the fourth largest city in Taiwan. Further north, both to the north and south of Taichung City, the third largest city in Taiwan is potential, near Tufen, as well as in the north near Taoyuan offers some advantages. And Taiwan is small. Compared to Ukraine, it's over 16 times smaller. However, it's almost nine times as densely populated. Combine this with the fact that most of central and eastern Taiwan on the mainland island is mountainous. So the vast majority of the population live in the few flat areas, mostly on the west coast. So any land combat in Taiwan will be unlike the majority of fighting in Ukraine. It will be mostly urban combat in densely populated towns and cities and the entire coastline of Taiwan has grown massively in the last few decades, and is now highly developed and populated. This is far from ideal for an invader. Urban warfare is ugly, and is often avoided as much as possible. Russia and Ukraine, for example, bypassed many major cities in the early days of the war, hoping to try to surround the cities and force them to surrender. When it became clear that that wouldn't happen, they had to conduct long, costly attacks to try to take them, like in Mariupol, Severodonetsk, or recently in Bakhmut, for example. Urban areas have unique and complex man-made terrain, from high-rises to stadiums to industry, the population and handling their needs, different groups, beliefs, and influences in different areas, and the infrastructure that links the two. Energy, the economy, transportation, distribution, communications, and so on. And all these need to be very carefully considered and understood when conducting urban operations. But down to the details. The roughly 200 kilometers across the strait, at best, means it would take five or six hours for a ship to reach the mainland. During that time, Taiwan would know that they're coming and they would be extremely vulnerable to attack. Things like satellites today mean there's virtually no chance of completely catching Taiwan off guard. They're gonna see you build up your forces, ships being prepared, aircraft, large numbers of troops, and so on for weeks, if not months, before you're ready to launch. And Taiwan has built up a massive anti-access capability to attempt to stop them. Air launched, ship launched, and both from fixed and mobile site ground system anti-ship missiles would be the biggest challenge for China, and they'd have to deal with them first. They'd have to find and strike as many of these anti-ship missile sites as possible, as well as dealing with their decently large navy of roughly 70 ships that are capable of launching these anti-ship missiles, and then also attacking Taiwan's air bases to try to limit their air force's ability to operate. Once that is done, then they need to rapidly land and build up a large number of forces on the mainland, and likely land at multiple locations simultaneously to complicate defenses. There's a few ways that China could get its forces to the mainland. Airborne and air assault, as well as by ship. The war in Ukraine seems to have showed the difficulty in airborne operations against any enemy with modern air defenses. So until those are thoroughly dealt with in a region, those operations are likely going to be limited. By sea would be the main option. China has eight large Type 71 amphibious transport docks and three Type 75 helicopter dock ships. Also about 40 smaller landing ships and another 20 much smaller 700 ton capacity ships. Now, assuming they can utilize one-fourth of these, which honestly is an extremely optimistic number, they'd be able to deploy roughly one of those combined arms brigades per trip. 
Again, six hours there, six back, plus a few hours each for loading and unloading. That would mean in the first two days, they might be able to deploy at least three fully supplied brigades, some 15,000 troops. And that's assuming that none are sunk in the process. Then there's the issue of sustaining them all. Getting troops on land is one thing, but they can't operate for long without a massive and continuous delivery of supplies and reinforcements. One thing that would likely be key is trying to capture one or multiple ports as soon as possible. That way they can bring in much larger ships with a lot more supplies. And China has a massive number of civilian ships that can bring a large amount of reinforcements, and even tanks, to the island. And they've even conducted exercises recently using these. If they can do that, the situation likely becomes extremely difficult for Taiwan. So, is it enough? It's almost certain China would get to Taiwan, but the big issue would be what to do when it gets there. Can it get enough supplies and reinforcements there in time? Can they break out from the beachhead before being counterattacked? Also, what level of resistance would the Taiwanese put up? Ukraine has shown to be willing to resist much more than most people expected, which has benefited them greatly in the war. The Iraqi army in 2003, the majority of them simply surrendered or went into hiding, making it relatively easy for the US to move in and take their capital city of Baghdad in less than a month. Obviously, later many of those soldiers joined an insurgency though, which is another variable for Taiwan. So, without US support, how would Taiwan do? It's honestly up in the air. Despite China's much, much larger military, it would still be an extremely, extremely difficult task to take Taiwan. Again, don't forget to check out Conflict of Nations. With my link in the description, you'll get that exclusive gift, 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free. But again, it's only available for 30 days, so don't miss out. Click the link down in the description, choose your country, and fight your way to victory.